Good evening, everybody. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 17 tonight as we continue looking through this book. <clears throat> and I'll remind us that we're in this section of Luke where Jesus is journeying to Jerusalem, uh, beginning around chapter 9, verse 51, concluding around chapter 20, the end of chapter 20, when Jesus finally enters Jerusalem. And it's in this section that, again, we get a lot of unique teachings in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to see more of that uh, tonight. And so uh, one of the things that I want to point out in the context of what we've been looking at is starting maybe around Luke 13 or 14, Luke has been showing us who is in the kingdom and who's not in the kingdom. And it's unexpected. So the Pharisees are not part of the kingdom in these chapters. You have that brought up in Luke chapter 14, for example, when Jesus is at that dinner with some Pharisees, some of these Jewish leaders, and he, he has some hard words to say to them. In chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, remember it was the tax collectors and the sinners that were drawing near to Jesus, and then he gives the parable of the prodigal son. <clears throat> um, can anybody remind us what one of the main points of the prodigal son was? Why was that parable given? Yeah, good. So there's always a path to God. Right. The, the, the one that you thought was good in the story, the older brother that has been with his father the whole time, he's just as lost as the younger brother was at the beginning. And both people need a path back to God. And so Jesus is giving that parable in order to help those people uh, overcome their self-righteousness uh, and then there's unlikely people who are part of the kingdom. Um, in Luke chapter 14, around verses 21 to 24, it talks about going to the highways and byways and getting the lame and the blind and the crippled and all those people to be part of this feast. Um, look over at chapter 17, verse 16. We're going to look at, at the context of this in just a moment. But in, uh, starting in verse 15, these ten lepers that are healed, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at, at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. A Samaritan leper here is the one of the ten lepers that's going and giving thanks to God. And so these chapters are showing you that the people that you think oftentimes are like locked in to get to heaven, locked in to be with God forever. Uh, those sometimes are the people that are so arrogant that they're not going to make it. And then the people that have come from really rough backgrounds or people that maybe don't have um, certain things in order that you think they ought to have or something, those are oftentimes the people that are the most receptive to the gospel. And so um, we're going to continue seeing that kind of idea in this chapter tonight. But in the first 10 verses... He's going to talk about forgiveness and then thankfulness, and then the chapter is going to end with this discussion of the coming kingdom, and when this kingdom is established, God is going to bring some vengeance, and so that's how you can remember these chapters. And by the way, as Jesus has been talking about what kingdom people are going to be like, another way that you could think of the word of kingdom is like, what is the nation of America like? Well, it's, you could describe it in, in these ways. What's the nation of God like? You know, it's a spiritual nation. But what kind of, like if somebody was to ask you, some, you met somebody from some other country, and they're like, hey, tell me about your country. Uh, what kind of people live there? And if you were to give, like, a description of the people that live in the United States. What kind of people are in the nation of Jesus? What kind of people dwell in this country? And in this chapter, we're going to see that it's got to be people who are forgiving. It's got to be people who have thankfulness. And if they don't have these kinds of qualities, then they're not letting God change them. There will be vengeance. And so let's go ahead and look at chapter 17. We'll start out by reading verses 1 through 4 in this section on the instructions on forgiveness. And he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come... But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. 
Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you probably should forgive him. But maybe not. You, it says you must forgive him. Uh, I want to, with this stumbling block discussion that he has in the first two verses, notice that he warns about causing one. He doesn't say, you know, if you get to the number three, you should worry about causing three people to stumble. He says, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble. Now, what do you think this text means by little ones? Yeah, I think it could be, one of them could be new converts. What else could this be? What was that? It could be children, like uh, the down, which would be like the downcast of the world, like the, the rejected in the world. Yeah, Brittany? Yeah, yeah, the Lazaruses of the world. Like if, if you run roughshod over people that you think you can take advantage of and you become a stumbling block to some of these kinds of people or just, I think the broader application could end up being made to, to really anybody. You become a stumbling block. Now, what is the imagery of being a stumbling block? What does that imagery convey? Yeah, like every time they're trying to walk, like you just get in their way and they keep tripping up over you because you're, you're putting something in their path that's causing them to not be able to walk in the ways that they should walk. And so Jesus is getting us to be concerned about how we influence one another. Now look at this question. What are some examples of behaviors or attitudes that could lead others astray? How can we actively avoid being stumbling blocks to those around us? So let's start with the first question here. What are some examples of behaviors or attitudes that can negatively affect one another in this room? Okay, good. What else? Condescending. Yeah, condescending, arrogant kinds of attitudes. Remember in Numbers chapter 11 when the Israelites were complaining in the wilderness? And what is it that God does when they start complaining the first time? He sends a fire. I, I think the fire shows that one of the things complaining does is it spreads. Have you ever seen this happen before in a church where one person starts complaining about such and such and they start complaining to other people about it and now everybody kind of gets lit, lit on fire because of that complaint? So complaining could be an example of that. What else? Right. Right. And, and, you know, obvious examples, I'll get to you in just a second. Obvious examples of this would be Christians who are actually participating in sinful activities and inviting other people from church to be part of that. Sometimes we can think that there's never any danger as long as it's somebody from church, and that's not always the case. There can sometimes be some rabble rousers. Yeah. Yeah, like drawing lines about certain things and having strong opinions in a way that divides people and makes them feel like they got to care more about some of these kinds of things. Next year is the election. we got to be careful about that kind of stuff. Yeah, good. That, this isn't my job to do. And then now everybody's starting to think that same sort of thing. And there's a kind of this inactivity that can happen. LR? Yeah, good. good. Good example of that. Um, what kind of necklace should you wear if you're a stumbling block to somebody? Or what kind of necklace would it be good for you to wear before ever doing that? Just get a millstone 
and jump into the water and that would be better for you than if you ever were a stumbling block to anybody. Like, that's a shocking imagery. You realize how serious this is to recommend something that somebody shouldn't be doing, to discourage somebody from proactively doing good things for the Lord. Oh, you don't have to do that much for the Lord or something like that. And you discourage people from doing things that they ought to be doing. All right, so now connected to this is this need to forgive. So let's say somebody maybe was a stumbling block to you. Let's say um, uh, somebody had done something to hurt you in one way or another. What is your Christian responsibility in verse 3? First, it's to rebuke. Now, um, I, I plan on saying some things about that in a sermon on Sunday night. So let's emphasize the forgiveness part of this. Rebuke and forgiveness are both things that Christians are supposed to do here. Um, look at this question. The passage emphasizes the importance of forgiving others even if they sin against us repeatedly. How can we cultivate a heart of forgiveness in our own lives? Now, I just want to imagine for a moment that um, Adam Leverett stands up and over the course of the next 40 minutes, I just walk up to him and I punch him in the face in front of all of you. And he starts bleeding. And I say, hey, I'm sorry about that, Adam. What's his, what is he supposed to do? What's he supposed to do? Yeah, so let me get you on the other side now. No, he's supposed to say, I forgive you. Let's say two minutes later, I go up to him and I do the same thing again. And I say, I, sorry about that, man. Moment of weakness. And I do it five more times. What is, what is Jesus telling him he must do in this passage? You must forgive. It's, this is not optional. This is something that you're commanded to do. And so how can we cultivate a heart of forgiveness in our life? How, do, how can we do that? Yeah, it's tough. Now, the next part of the text is going to help us with this, but what else, what would you guys say about how we can cultivate this? Yeah. I think there would be a carrot and a stick motivation. If I don't show mercy to people, why should I ever expect it from God? On the other hand, the thing that empowers me to, to be forgiving is realizing that Jesus forgave me first. So why would I not give it, pass it on to other people? Because the wrongs done against me are not nearly as great as the wrongs I've done against God that have been forgiven. So I have to meditate on that and, and think about those kinds of things. Now... What is forgiveness? What does it mean to forgive somebody? That's sort of the language in Jeremiah 31, um, that in the new covenant, God will forgive your iniquities and he'll remember your sins no more. Have you ever tried to forgive somebody, but you still felt bitter towards the person? Does that mean that you didn't forgive them? Yeah, you got some meditation to do, but, but forgiveness fundamentally is, a, is not a feeling, but it's a promise to not hold something against somebody anymore. And so if I'm not holding it over them anymore, and I'm not, I don't keep bringing it up because it's been, it's been done away with, I'm not bringing it up to you anymore, I'm not holding it over you, can you wrestle with your feelings of bitterness and pray and, and God will be patient to help you have different feelings, but it still be the case that you have forgiven the person because you're not bringing it up against them anymore. I think so. So I think one misunderstanding of forgiveness is that it's a feeling, but I, the Bible teaches that it's a promise to not hold something against somebody anymore. And as you hold that promise, your feelings will follow. But that's the responsibility that we have. Now, I want to keep going in this text because this text continues talking about this idea. Look at verses 5 through 10. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me a while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? 
Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. All right. In this context, why might the disciples say, increase our faith? Yeah, Jesus says some things that are really difficult. Hey, you got to forgive somebody even if they punch you in the face seven times in one day. You have to keep forgiving them. You can't hold it against them if they've asked for forgiveness in this way. And so um, the disciples go, whoa, that takes a lot of faith. That's going to take like like a thousand percent faith for me to be able to ever do that for somebody because you don't know, Jesus, the things people have done against me. You don't know my whole story. Of course you would have, but those are the kinds of excuses people will give sometimes. And so they're saying increase our faith because this is a really high, like high instruction. Who can live up to this? Have you ever felt that way when you've looked at passages like this? You've got to forgive. You, you can't hold it against them anymore. You, you work on the bitterness of your heart. Um, why does Jesus in this context bring up the power of the mustard seed? The faith of a mustard seed? Why does this fit this context? Yeah. What about it? Yeah. And and the the little like this is not this is almost a rebuke of Jesus saying increase our faith. Okay, this isn't a matter of you needing your faith increased. It's a matter of whether or not you have faith. Well, that hurts even more now. So think about it this way. Lots of faith in the wrong place makes you weak. But a little bit of faith in the right place is stronger than, a lo- than strong faith in the wrong place. Now, I just, that, so let me just say it this way. I may have used this illustration before. But let's say that I'm running in the forest and there's um, like some kind of crazy bear attacking me and I'm, I jump across a ravine and I look at, before I jump, I look at these branches and I'm trying to assess which one is going to hold up my strength. And I got a lot of confidence in this branch over here. It looks real strong. And I jump and I grab it and it breaks. I had a lot of confidence in that branch, but did my, my great amount of faith, is that what saved me? No, it didn't save me. I put my faith in the wrong thing. But look, what if I'm a little bit more timid and I see another branch and I go, that, that one, um, I think that'll do it. I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm 30% sure, but I, I don't know if I got a better option. And I jump and I grab it. Which person had more faith? The one that plummeted had the more faith. But the one that had the less faith put it in the right place. So this is, yeah, is it ideal that our faith would increase and our faith would grow? Absolutely. But if you had faith in the right place to begin with, you would be able to do this forgiveness business. It's not a matter of increase our faith. It's a matter of, do you really trust what I'm saying? Yeah, LR. Right. Yeah, good. Good. Now, related to this is this thing with the servant and obedience. Like, you know, if you got a servant that you're, he's out in the field and everything, like, is the master going to go, hey, you've been working really hard today, just like, great job, just put your feet up on the table, let me make you some food right now. No, he comes and he says, all right, can you make me some food now? And after the guy's done all of the work, um, what is he supposed to say? unprofitable service. I, it's not like I did anything that's deserving really of, of praise or any kind of credit. Um, when Jesus says you forgive and you forget, it's your duty. It's not like some optional super noble thing. It's just something that you have to do if you're a Christian. If you want to be part of the country of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus, the nation of Jesus, the people who are part of it are forgiving. And, and, there, and, and there's no exceptions to this. 
And it's just your duty to do that. You're not going to obligate the Lord. Jesus isn't going to look at you and go, well, you know, you were exceptionally forgiving. And so, you know, there are some other people in my country that weren't very forgiving, but that was kind of always optional. You're going to be exalted to like my prime minister or something like that. That's not how this works. Every kingdom citizen, everybody who's really part of the kingdom is a forgiving person. Um, and so I'll just say it this way. The hard things that Jesus taught they really just come down to whether or not you believe him. If there are hard things that you see Jesus teaching, and you go, you know what, I just don't know if I can do that. You know, he just doesn't know everything that I say, and we're coming, look, coming up with excuses on why this doesn't apply to me or whatever. Who, who are you? But just a servant. You don't have the right to argue with him. You don't have the right to say, this one doesn't apply to me. Any comments or questions on any of that? Yeah, Travis. Right. Same same sort of thing. Like love is is an action. Forgiveness is a promise. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions people miscon misconceptions people have of forgiveness is that it's a feeling it's not a feeling it's a promise to not hold it over somebody anymore your feelings will follow but it's fundamentally a promise all right um and if you do that good for you except that was just your duty look at verses 11 through 19 on this story of thankfulness on the way to jerusalem he was passing along between samaria and galilee and as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And they went as the, and they went as, sorry, and as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return to, and praise God, uh, God, give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. All right. Uh, you see again this theme of Jesus' journey in verse 11 as he's making his way. There's so many verses in these chapters showing that. But these lepers stay at a distance from him. And they have this request that they would be uh, healed how was it that they were healed? Like, at, Jesus sends them off, and at what point in the story are they healed? On the way. So imagine for a moment, like, Jesus is right here, and there's ten people that come up to Jesus, and they're like, hey, we need to be healed. And he's like, okay, go show yourselves to the priest. And they, like, they're still standing there, like, but we're not healed yet. He goes, yeah, just go. And is it like a hundred yards down the road, one of them looks at their hand like, whoa, like we, we're, we're being healed now because we've been on our way, we trusted that it was going to happen. And as they're looking at themselves, you can imagine only one of them goes, hey guys, I got I to gotta go back and give them thanks. And the other ones are like, well, we have to go to the priests. He's like, I have to go, I, I can't do anything but go thank this guy for what he did for me. And who is this one that came back but a Samaritan? This is the third of three times that the Gospel of Luke brings up Samaritans. And again, this shows you the theme of Jesus interacting with outcasts. What is Jesus' question here, though? Where's the other nine? Uh, what do you think this teaches us about thankfulness? It's important. Jesus notices it. What else? It's expected. It's another duty. Yeah, good. Um, what percentage of these lepers were thankful? 10%. Do you think thankfulness is a common thing that we see in people? Like, it, let's just put the, the statistics of this story and apply it to West End. So our membership is, 
our attendance, I don't know what our numbers, our, our attendance is around, let's just say 340 people or 350 or something. So what's 10% of that, 35 people? Could it be the case that thir only 35% of you are thankful people? Would you say that God has healed you of your spiritual leprosy? That, that you were a spiritual leper and, and this stuff was spreading all throughout you and it was a death sentence and it caused you to be separated from other people. You couldn't be part of the community. And then God forgave you and he cleansed you. But only 10% of you are, th are really thankful to God. You, the rest of you have just kind of gone on your way doing your own things. You're not really, you, you're really eager to receive things from God, but you're, you're not showing a lot of gratitude for the things that he did for you once you got it. And so uh, one question you could ask here is, does, does God ever hear the end of your thankfulness to him in your prayers? Does he ever, does he consistently hear it from you? Uh, maybe 10% of us. If I'm just taking those numbers and just applying it here. I'm not saying that I think that, I don't know the answer to that. But that 10% number kind of makes this concrete in a sense. Um, all right, look at this question. Jesus tells the Samaritan that his faith has made him well. What connection do you see between faith and gratitude in this statement? And the bigger the question really is, like, what connection do you see between faith and gratitude? Yeah, like people of faith that trust in God um, are going to be people that have gratitude. Do you think that sometimes we as Christians, like the kind of complaining that we do about government and um, the concerns that we have for the world and the, do you think we, we model thankfulness and gratitude to the world? Or do we get concerned about everything and complain about everything? And here, what we're commanded to do are be people that realize what the Lord has done for us. And from the heart, we give thanks to him. We have a different demeanor than people in the world do. Yeah, Travis. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps the other ones are just concerned about getting back in community with people rather than in community with God. Whatever the reason would be, Jesus has a rebuke for those people, essentially. Like, they should give it, come back and return thanks and praise him for what he's done. So, yeah. Yeah, Ryan? The, yes. But the, the one at the end in verse 19, rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. Well, I thought, I thought he was already well. But now he's well, I think, fully. I think there may be something about the forgiveness of sins here, something like that. But he's, like, that means that the other ones that didn't return to Jesus are not fully made well yet, even though their, their leprosy might be taken care of. There's a further thing that needs to happen that only this guy receives. So, yeah. Good. All right, anything else about any of that? All right, so that story isn't in any of the other Gospels. There's actually not a lot of leper healing stories in the whole Bible. Uh, um, there's a lot of instructions in Leviticus 11, or uh, uh, 13 and 14 about it, but there's, um, there's not a lot of leper healing stories. There's Miriam in the Old Testament, she has it, um, and then there's Naaman the leper, and then there's a couple in Jesus' ministry. But, um, all right, let's go ahead and look at this section on vengeance. There's probably more to say about this section than the others. Uh, just because there's a lot of questions that can come up from this. Uh, look at how this starts in verses 20 and 21. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And you, there's going to be different translations on how that's worded there. But the question of the Pharisees here is, when would the kingdom come? Up to this point in the Gospel of Luke, we've been hearing that the kingdom is near. The kingdom is near. But, but when is it going to come? Like, we want the signs. When is it that, is it going to be a flash of lightning in the sky? Like, what is this going to look like? How are we going to know that it's finally come? And Jesus' answer here 
is that it's not coming in observable ways. It's not coming in, in all kinds of ways that are like flashy, that are just, they're, they're going to make the news and all that sort of thing. And so this is where we get this debate on how to translate this verse. The kingdom is in the midst of you or it's within you. How many of you have a Bible translation where it says it's within you? What translation do you have? NIV? The New King James has it, yeah? New King James. Okay, so the New King James says that it's within you. The ESV and other translations will say it's in the midst of you. So there's two options on what Jesus means by this. Either he means that the kingdom is within their hearts, but the problem with that is that he's talking to Pharisees who in this context, these last three chapters, are not part of the kingdom. So some people have said, well, the kingdom is within, within you, meaning that the reign of God, the rule of God, it's within your guys' hearts. I don't think so. I think Jesus is saying Jesus as, as the king is in their midst. Where is it going to come in? Where is the kingdom? Guys, the kingdom's in the midst of you right now. The king is here, but you're not acknowledging me to be the king. Um, and so Jesus is going to give in verse 22 an answer to his disciples about this. Now, when Jesus says that the kingdom is in the midst of you, is he saying there that the church is all around you right now? Is the church all around him right now? Is the kingdom in the Bible always the church? No, it's not. Is the kingdom closely tied to the church? Yes, the church are the citizens of the kingdom of God. But they're not always the same thing. And so sometimes when I hear people say, well, what's the kingdom? Well, it's the church. Are we sure about that? Because the kingdom involves the, the ruler, Jesus and his subjects, and the way he rules, and everything like that. The kingdom is broader, a bigger thing than the church, but the church is a critical part of the kingdom. So they're not the exact same thing. Everybody clear on that, or have any questions on that? Do we all agree on that? Like a pass Do passages like this show us that they're not the same thing? You guys see that? Because was the church established yet? Was the kingdom in their midst with the ruler being among them and he's starting to give them pictures of what the kingdom was going to be like? Yes. So, all right, very good. Uh, all right, before we read 22 to 37, <clears throat> I want to highlight a repeated phrase in these verses. Uh, in verse 22, Jesus is going to say, the days of the Son of Man. In verse 24, the Son of Man in his days. In verse 26, the days of the Son of Man. In verse 30, the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So four times in this next section, Jesus is going to be talking about the day he comes or the day that this kingdom is, is more fully revealed in one way or another. So he keeps using this phrase. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what, what is this day that he's referring to? Because it's in answer to the question, when is the kingdom? When is it going to come? So let's start out um, by looking at verses... 22 to 30. And he said to his disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days, uh, yeah, the day, uh, when you will see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here, do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building... But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. All right, there's some debates about what is happening in this text. Um, Jesus says these events won't be hidden when the kingdom finally comes uh, in its fullness, in, in, a, in a fuller measure. When it comes in a fuller measure, it's, gonna be, uh, it's not going to be hidden. Jesus has got to suffer first. But in verses 26 to 30, he compares this to the days of Noah and Lot. What happened in the days of Noah and Lot? 
There's a judgment. So that means that the coming of this kingdom in the way Jesus is talking about it here is going to also bring what at the same time? Some kind of a judgment. And so what kind of judgment is this referring to? And also this is going to be a time when nobody would expect. People are going to be eating and drinking and marrying and, and having a great old time and all that sort of thing, but they're not going to be expecting it. And so uh, what are the instructions to prepare for this? Look at verses 31 to 33. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in his house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. We'll keep reading through the rest of the chapter. I tell you, in the night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and one left. And they said to him, where, Lord? And he said, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. All right. What are the instructions to get ready for when this judgment comes? Yeah. So flee, don't get the goods in your house. Remember Lot's wife. You guys have all heard the joke before, right? That if there's like a clock like we have at the back of the church building, there was some church that put the Bible verse, remember Lot's wife, next to the clock. Har, har, har. You guys haven't heard that? I'm sure you guys have all heard that, right? Whatever. All right. Um, so does this sound like final judgment day to you? It doesn't to me. Because if, if final judgment day is coming and you see like Jesus coming in the clouds or whatever, like, oh no, better not get my iPad in my house. I better flee or something. Like this is talking about something that you could flee from. Some, and remember Lot's wife. It was the destruction of a particular place, Sodom and Gomorrah. And so don't look back. Like there's going to be some place that you have to flee and get out of. And you're not supposed to have some kind of longing for this place. Furthermore, there's going to be this division. One taken and one left. And, it, and where are they going to be taken? To this place where the vultures are, and they're going to be surrounding all the corpses. So what event is this talking about? Yeah, I think this is the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and Jesus makes another comment a couple chapters later in Luke 21, verses 28 and 21. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are uh, out of the country enter. It sounds very parallel to it. Like in both sections, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and you need to flee, you need to get out of there. Now, there's a lot of good Bible students who think that this is talking about final judgment day. I don't think that it is. And I think it's clear in this passage when he's talking to them to, to, to get out of here and everything. But no, remember that all this comes from the question, when is your kingdom coming? Okay, Jewish people who have rejected me, you'll know when Jerusalem's destroyed that I'm the king. Because you guys have rejected me. And I've, I've been in your midst. You've been seeing glimpses of the kingdom by looking at me. And unfortunately, it's going to have to come to a point where your city's destroyed, and then maybe you'll figure out that I'm the ruler. How many things in our life have to crumble and fall apart and keep breaking because we're not acknowledging Jesus as Lord, but we kept thinking that our ways of doing things were going to be okay, they were going to make us happy, it was going to make us blessed, and it kept wrecking our hearts. How many things have to break before we finally acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord? For Jerusalem, their city had to be destroyed. Now, uh, any, any comments or questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, good question. So why is one person taken, why, why is one left? The Tim LaHaye book series that talk about, like, the Left Behind series. Have you guys ever seen those movies or whatever where they're on a plane and then, like, you're sitting next to this guy, and you're talking to him, and then suddenly you look over, and they're gone, like, uh-oh, like, they were raptured, and now, like, there's going to be hell on earth for the next seven years or something like that. That's kind of the idea that they have. So, and that, they get this, they, they, one is taken, and one is left. One's left to live in hell on earth, and then the other ones are taken to be with God. Here, he's talking about, like, if there's women grinding at the mill, or there's somebody, 
that the Romans are going to come and they're just going to be grabbing people. They, don't, they can't grab everybody. And they're going to go bring them to this place of slaughter is kind of the picture. And so some people are going to be spared. There's going to be some people that are going to be destroyed, though. So here's a question, though. Why would we need a passage of Scripture that's telling us about a judgment that happened almost 2,000 years ago? So here's this last question. Whether this passage is referring to Jerusalem's destruction in 70 AD, how can we still learn from passages of fulfilled judgment and apply them to final judgment day? Now, the question here is aiming at this. Would, on final judgment day, would God judge for similar kinds of reasons that he would judge a specific place like Jerusalem or a specific place like Sodom and Gomorrah or a specific place like Edom? Would his reason for judgment be the same? Yes. So every time we see a localized judgment in the Bible, it's teaching us about final judgment day. Like they're warning shots saying, there's another one coming and it's final judgment day. You better be ready. So anytime we read judgment passages in the Bible, we can still take away lessons for final judgment day. We've just got to make sure that we're keeping it in its context first. So this is talking about Jerusalem. What lessons could we learn from this though? About our final judgment day. We're not taking anything with us. Uh, we got to be vigilant looking. We've got to be concerned about the things that Jesus has said. We've got to uh, be ready for that day is what a lot of these kinds of passages bring up. But if God is going to judge even his Jewish people, is he going to judge Christians one day too? Like we're going to all have to answer to him for the, the ways that we've lived. And so in the flow of thought of this chapter, are you a forgiving person? Are you a thankful person? Because there is vengeance coming one day. Do you care about growing in these character qualities? Do you care about letting the life of God live through you? This is not about earning your salvation by mustering up enough strength to become a thankful person or a forgiving person. This is about whether or not you've really realized what God has done for you. And when you think about that and you discipline yourself into thinking about that, it will transform you. Have you digested what God has done for you? If you haven't appreciated it, there's vengeance one day. Ryan? 34, uh, there'll be two in the bed. One, yeah, I think it would be the same. Two, two men in one bed? Well, it's like the days of Sodom, I tell you. Um, uh, I don't, I think it might be like, the, what translation do you have? New King James. I, I, I reckon it might be that the word man is like mankind and not the, what? A supplied word? Two will be in one bed, yeah. Yeah, so we got a couple theories going in here. Yeah. Two men and one woman? <laughs> what? <laughs> Two men, okay, all right, yeah. So I just couldn't hear you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I think it's an added word or... I, if, the, if the Greek word for man is there, I, I would take it that it's probably like the generic term for mankind or people in general, not the specific gender term. Um, so, yeah. Stephen? Yes. 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 Yep. Yes. And so Jesus predicted this was going to happen here. And it happened like 40 years later. I am of the belief, and you can disagree with me if you want, that all the New Testament was written before 70 AD. Because if you had books written afterwards, those books, you can... I would just have to, this, this is speculation, but wouldn't it just make so much sense for some of these books to say, hey, by the way, Jesus was right about the destruction of Jerusalem. He, he said it was going to happen, and it happened, but you don't have any books in the New Testament saying that it's happened. Maybe Revelation is saying, once again, it will happen, but that's even debatable. Um, and so, yeah, but J Jesus said it was going to happen, it happens, and none of these books are saying, and by the way, do you remember, do you see that it happened? Like, as if this was all written before it actually happened. So that's a good apologetic point, too, even. Anything else on this? All right. Uh, all right.
Thanks for the good discussion, and uh, we'll pick it up on Sunday morning in Luke chapter 18.